Hi, my name is John LaBelle. I'm a professor of architecture at Pratt Institute. This is a lecture for first year students on ancient Greek architecture and Greek culture given in fall 2017. Good morning. Today we're talking about Greece, a huge subject, and we're going to vastly oversimplify it for our purposes to get our key underlying ideas. So the first thing we want to do is get ourselves located and say that Greece is a Mediterranean culture. So here is the Mediterranean and we're going to be staying here next week. We're going to Rome. But eventually, we're going to be looking at India, China, Japan as well. But right now, we're focused around the Mediterranean and for most of today, the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, first thing we want to say about Greece, and I'm going to jump to next week, Rome is eventually an empire. So Rome is a unified political entity that surrounds the Mediterranean. Greece is a series of independent city-states, often at war with each other. What makes them Greece is that they share a language and a culture. So despite being these independent city-states, they had a very strong self-consciousness of being Greeks. Now we want to note that uh, Greek settlements appear throughout the Mediterranean. And we also want to note that late in our period we're going to cover today, Alexander the Great conquers uh, a huge amount of space. Starts with the Persian Empire, includes Egypt, a lot of North Africa, and he even goes into India. We don't want to call this an empire because Alexander dies before he can consolidate it and give it a direction. And so after his death, it splits up. Well, <clears throat> with each of his conquests, he would leave behind a general to run the territory. After his death, those became uh, political entities. And most famously, Egypt under General Ptolemy. Uh, and so from the around 320 BC on, up until Cleopatra is defeated in 30, Egypt is ruled by Greeks. So Cleopatra was part of a Greek dynasty. Now we begin our stories with Minoan Crete, a highly developed late Neolithic culture involved in trading, it's peaceful, and a whole vast culture. Some of what we know about is limited by the fact that the whole eastern Mediterranean world blew up. There was a huge volcanic eruption sometime between 1642 and 1540. I don't know exactly when, but this huge volcanic eruption producing tsunamis, tidal waves, and destroys much of... Minoan Crete had a series of palaces, the most famous Kenosis, and these were quite extensive. All we have today are the footings, which look rather labyrinthine and so they're associated with the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur in the labyrinth. There have been restorations done by Sir Arthur Evans, and they are considered fanciful. This Minoan culture is associated with goddesses. We see a snake goddess here and a veneration of the bull. And remember those bull horns in the caves of Lascaux that we saw? This remains a theme throughout Neolithic cultures. And this Minoan Crete was a late Neolithic culture. We have these famous depictions of the 
bull dances or bull athletics in which youths would face a charging bull, grab the horns, and flip over it. Excavations are being done to this day. The volcano took place at the island of Thera. The archaeological digs that are doing to this day are actually underwater. Everything above water has since been looted or destroyed, but there are underwater excavations being done. Mosaics stand up pretty well. This is some artwork from Thera. Incredibly beautiful, the sensitivity of the lines here. The Minoans are replaced by the Mycenaeans, and they are Bronze Age warrior chieftains. They're warlike, they have citadels, and if you want to know more about the Mycenaeans, they are the people you're reading about in the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the Greeks who invade Troy in the Iliad are Mycenaeans. Their area spreads through much of Greece, includes Crete. The Mycenaeans occupied hilltop citadels, fortifications. They were a very warlike culture, done with large unfinished stone, and at the and these citadels included what we call the Megaron. Megaron is the throne room. There, it's a small space for columns, fire pit in the center, thrown off to one side. We know a lot about the Megaron because it's described in Homer's The Odyssey. The Odyssey begins with Penelope, uh, Odysseus's wife, saying to her son Telemachus, uh, it's been 20 years since Dad's been away. Why don't you go out and see if you can find out where he might be? And Telemachus goes to the palace of King Nestor and meets him in his Megaron, which Homer describes in some detail. And we're going to see later, perhaps this Megaron plays a role in, in evolving into the Greek temple. We also see among the Mycenaeans a Tholos tomb. This was originally thought to be a treasury, a place where valuables were kept, so it, it's called the treasury of Atreus, but it's actually a tomb. They would place bodies in here for a period of time for their reabsorption into the earth and then bury them elsewhere. And we see a pattern very similar to what we saw in the New Grange Passage Mound. We're interested here in the vault of the interior. It's not a true dome, but a sort of corbel dome. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the domes in Rome. Okay, now to get ourselves a little oriented, and you're not going to be able to take notes from this, but since we're talking about more than a thousand years, I want to just sort of get a sense of where we are. So. <clears throat> 1200 BC is the Trojan War that we read about in the Iliad. 500 years later, Homer writes the Iliad and the Odyssey. So Homer is writing 500 years after it actually happened. Then when we get to the 300s, 400s, and 500s, we get classical Greece that we think of. The Greek tragedies, Greek classical art, Plato and Aristotle, etc. That is the 3, 4, and 500s BC. 443 to 429 is uh, Periclean Greece. Pericles is a great enlightened leader responsible for much of the great culture of Athens that we associate with the Greeks. 356, Alexander the Great is born and he eventually conquers all of Greece and then the Persian Empire and included in his conquest is Egypt where he builds Alexandria, a new capital. This is important because Alexandria is the center of Greek culture until it's overthrown in uh, 30 BC by the Romans when they defeat Cleopatra. Now, just so we can orient, we think of 
Greece and Rome, almost like one word. So 509 BC is the uh, Rome becomes a republic, 27 BC, Rome becomes uh, an empire, 125 AD, the Pantheon building we'll see next week is built. And as opposed to um, 449, the construction of the Parthenon building we'll see in a few moments. So you can refer back to this just to get oriented over this thousand year period. Now, when we talk about Greece, there are numerous independent city-states often at war with each other. The two most famous are Athens and Sparta. And to this day, we contrast these two cultures and discuss their different values. So Athens was a sea power with a major navy, much larger. Athens was much larger than Sparta. They valued art, culture, education and they were often a democracy. Sparta was inland and more isolated, valued strength, austerity, military skills. Every young man and even women received military training through most of their education. So they were highly militaristic and they were often at war with each other. Athens had the advantage of being far larger. Sparta had the advantage of being highly militaristic. Sparta eventually wins because a plague uh, decimates Athens. And much as we'd rather not talk about it, war is very important. Every man trains as a soldier. They were, for the most part, all citizen soldiers. So the soldiers were called hoplites, and they were armed with shields and very long spears. They would put their shields up as a wall and their spears would extend out beyond it. Now, just to get a little bit into pop culture, how many people saw the movie The 300? That's very much what it looked like. They put up a wall of shields and the spears would extend far out beyond them. They also had military machinery, including siege engines. They built fortified towers that they'd roll up to the walls of a city and go over the walls from the siege engines. Alexander the Great himself, in his conquest, would they get to a city they're going to lay siege to, and all the soldiers would be prepared for a long siege. Alexander would just go over the wall, and his men would say, holy mackerel, we better get in there. <laughs> So very aggressive warfare, very much a part of their culture. And they had naval ships, and they were called tyramines. And this was because of the three rows of oars. So the Mediterranean did not have the winds of the Atlantic Ocean, and their warships needed oarmen to row them, and they would battle by ramming, cutting in half enemy ships. There's something called the Millennium Dialogue. The Athenians invade Milos. Milos was a ally of Sparta. And the uh, Millennians say, look, we'll just be neutral, leave us alone. And the Athenians say, no, surrender and join us. And the Millennians say, we're not going to do that. So the there's a speech between, which is reconstructed, in which the Millennians say, this is a reasonable thing to do, and the Athenians say, we're stronger, we're going to kill all the men, enslave all the boys, and make sex slaves out of all the women, which is what they did, and they do. That was Greek warfare, ancient world warfare. One of the most famous battles between the Greeks and the Persians, the Persian had an extensive empire, and they wanted Greece to be part of it, and they would keep invading. There's old description here of how 5,200 Greeks held off between 70,000 and 2 million uh, Persians. And to oversimplify, but to give you a picture, the Persians would send an army of a million men, 300 Spartans would have to hold them off at the pass, until the Athenians could bring around their navy with 40,000 men and they'd wipe out the Persians. And finally the Greeks got tired of this 
And that's when Alexander the Great conquers Persia to put a stop to it. Okay, the Greek temple, our key work of architecture for this lecture. And this is a Greek temple. Now, the Greek temple has a long history going over hundreds of years, but we're going to simplify it and look at its key form. This is Sanctuary of Athenia, 500 BC, and it's pretty typical. Typical. It gives us an idea of what these things are about. So, in studying a Greek temple, let me just jump ahead and make a point. Here are all the parts of the Greek temple, and we study them in a little bit of detail, but if we go back 150 years, an architecture student would know every detail of this. And here's a, a 19th, late 19th century book plate from Bannister Fletcher, where he gives all the proportions, the details, the profiles of the moldings. Now, why 150 years ago, or even 100 years ago, would you as a student have to know this in great detail? Anybody? This is a temple of Zeus, a Greek temple. This is the United States Supreme Court, 1935. Until modern architecture, we were building these things. You had to know it because you, you know, go to the 42nd Street Library, the Metropolitan Museum, Grand Central Station, they all have Greek and Roman columns on them. Uh, so we were building this stuff into the 20th century. So whereas today, we're just going to get a general idea of what it was about. 100 years ago, you would have to not only know it, but be able to do it. The first thing we want to notice is that we have a walled interior space and columns on the outside. In Egypt, the columns are on the inside. And there's an argument made that those columns are to hide the wall so that we don't think of the space. The Greeks were not into interior space. We did not go in here to worship, but rather there was just a statue in there, in, this, in the case of the Parthenon, a statue of Athena, and that's this cella. The apthodomus was just for the priest to keep offerings to bring to the statue. Now, what was this about? What was it for? Key idea here. The temple is an abode of the deity. Athena lives here. We want it to be beautiful and to keep her happy, to bring good fortune to our city. So Athena is the patron goddess of Athens and other cities would have other patron deities. Some other key parts, column, which has a base, a shaft, and a capital, although the Doric order, we'll see in a minute, does not have a base. There's a frieze, uh, a sculpture, typically a story of a war, and the pediment is this triangle, triangular thing up here filled with sculpture. So those are some of the key parts. This temple evolves over a period of time. So here's our megaron, and then more columns are put on the outside. There's columns on the inside, eventually those disappear. So there's a whole series of evolutionary steps from earlier forms to the classical Greek temple. It's suspected that perhaps the original temples were built in wood, and the way the detailing for that wood would be done is what led to all the particulars of the detailing of a temple. Key thing we have to know in Greek architecture is the orders. We should be able to just rattle off Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Those are the three Greek orders. We get to Rome, we're going to add one or two more. But we start with the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. So, the orders are mostly about the capital. The Doric has a kind of dinner plate, flattish capital. The Ionic has this curlicue called a volute. And the 
Corinthian has acanthus leaves. And we sort of have associations with these. This is more simple and direct. This is more elaborate and imperial. Uh, there are differences in proportions. The Doric is more squat. The Corinthian is more elongated. And when we get into it, the cornices are different in their parts and proportions. We'll go into that right now. And key idea here to remember, these Greek columns are made of these drums. So they would make these drums. They would then put a piece of bronze in here and then put on another drum and stack them up and then carve these indentations into them. The Romans made their columns out of one piece. So Roman columns, one piece, Greek columns, piled up drums. But even within one of these orders, uh, these are Doric orders. This is a Greek temple at Paestum. This is the Parthenon, we'll see in a minute. Notice how more squat, a stronger curving line, we'll see that in a minute, how big and flat the capital is. And now here the capital is more trim, the curve is less pronounced. So even within one of these orders, it changes over time. Now, I'm going to introduce an idea to tell you that it's baloney, so we need to know about it, but don't get hung up in it. And that's called optical corrections or entasis. It was claimed in the 19th century well, we notice that in Greek temples, the columns are not straight cylinders, but they uh, bulge and curve inward as they go up. And the bases are not flat, but they bulge upward very slightly. The claim was made that this was done to make them look straight. In other words, if the column were straight up and down, it would appear to go inward. We don't want to do that, so we make it bulge out. It was claimed that if they made the base flat, it would appear to sag, so we make it bulge so it will look flat. That's all baloney. We can see, obviously, right here, they knew they were making these bulges, and it was deliberate. Into the early 20th century, this was considered <coughs> crude and primitive, and this was considered elegant and refined. And in the late 19th century, the Parthenon, which is we're looking at here, we'll see in a minute, was considered the most perfect work of architecture ever, the greatest building, period. Today, it's one more good building. Louis Kahn, important modern architect, preferred these columns to these. These, he said, were bold and direct, and these were effete and over-refined. So, those are value judgments, and the point is, I'm not telling you it's one way or the other, but these values change over time. They're issues of taste, and one of the things to know about taste is that it changes. So, again, keep in mind that if we were in school here 100 years ago, Um, we would, or maybe even 80 years ago, we would be seriously studying this. You would be able to draw these columns and you would be putting them on your buildings. With modern architecture, that is rejected. But here we have the U.S. Supreme Court a, with its Corinthian columns uh, adapted from a Greek Corinthian example. Okay, so our key building for the Greek temple is the Parthenon, and I'll explain that word in a minute. And it is located on the Acropolis in Athens, Greece. So we'll see the Acropolis in a minute. So here's the Parthenon, not in good shape, but it's there to this day. How many people have been there? So it's a typical Greek temple in of the Doric order 
in its refined state. Columns on the outside, a cella, and a um, optodemus. And we can get into all the other parts. We won't do that here. The base is the um, stylobite, the steps, which are too, too tall to step up, stereobate. So again, if we were in school 100 years ago, we not only would know every part of this, we could go into the drafting room and draw it from memory if we were designing a building. Now, one of the interesting things about the Parthenon is, again, what is this temple? What is the Greek temple for? It's the home of a deity. The god lives there, the god or goddess, and represented by a sculpture. So here's a sculpture of Athena. I'll show you an example in a minute. And we don't know how it was lit. Was the roof open? So it's kind of a mystery. Was it only lit by lamplight, or was there some opening to let the light in? In the pediment, there is sculpture. So here's a real famous fun story. Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire, and a English nobleman, who an amateur archaeologist, Lord Elgin, was there, and he goes to the local governor and says, can I put a scaffolding up on the path, and I'd like some of my people to make some drawings of the sculpture. And the governor says, sure. He puts up a scaffolding, rips off the sculpture, and takes it to England. <laughs> The Greeks are still in court to this day trying to get it back. So you'll find the, they're called the Elgin marbles, the sculpture from the Parthenon pediment in the London Museum. Here they are. We have written descriptions of the sculpture of Athena being made of ivory and gold. It was not going to last 2,000 years, got looted. But this is a, eh, kind of an awkward attempt at a recreation based on the written descriptions and speculation about how the light got in. But lots of gold and ivory. One of the reasons the Spartans went to war with the Athenians is the Athenians said, okay, we're the lead power defending Greece against the Persians. Uh, we need to build up our navy. Give us a lot of money. So all the Greek states did, and then the Athenians spent it on building the Parthenon. <laughs> and the Athenians said, you stole our money. <laughs> now, it, the Parthenon's in bad shape, not because it fell down, but during the Greek Civil War to gain independence from the Ottoman Empire, it was being used to store munitions. It got hit by artillery, and the whole thing blew up. So to this day, they're trying to put it back together. So we're not going to talk about the Pantheon. Just We'll get to that next week. But just to warn you, the Parthenon is a Greek temple. The Pantheon is a Roman temple. Now, Parthenon refers to Parthenogenesis. Um, Athena was a virgin goddess. Now, virgin doesn't necessarily mean she didn't have sex. It means she, she may not have, but she was not married. She's an independent woman. So that's a, the technical meaning of a virgin. So Parthenó is virginal. So this is a temple to the virgin goddess Athena. Pan means all. There used to be an airline called Pan American Airlines that would fly all over the Americas, so it's Pan, Pan Am or Pan American. So this is a temple to all of the gods. So Pan for all, Pantheon, Parthenó for virginal, uh, Parthenon. And they're 500 years apart. The Romans borrow the Greek temple form for the entrance to the Parthenon, but then they get into vaulted and domed architecture, which the Greeks did not do. So we will see that next week. Other building we have to know also from the Acropolis is the Erechtheion, or Erechtheion. So I'm not going to go into this. <clears throat> People try to, you know, art historians have to say art history stuff. Um, so you'll find a section about this in our textbook. 
trying to figure out what the hell this is, why they kept adding on to it, why it's so weird, why it's not like a Greek temple. We'll just leave it at that it's weird. Uh, they keep adding on to it. We have uh, this porch here of caryatids. So we have a typical temple front here that we're not seeing. We have an extension here. We have a base coming out here. And we have the porch here. You don't see the columns for the porch because they've cut the section below. A caryatid is a column in the shape of a human being, usually women. So these are women holding up the roof. Parthenon and Erechtheion are located on the Acropolis in Athens. Every major Greek city has an Acropolis. The Acropolis is the, where, the center where all the temples are. There are other temples as well, uh, built over a period of time, but it's the major religious center. And <clears throat> Athens is fortunate in that this is perfectly formed. So we have this large rock outcropping that provided this elevated space where they locate the temples. Here is the Parthenon, here is the Erechtheion. So the, every year Athens celebrates something called the Pan-Athean Way. So there is a celebratory march from outside of the city, through the city, and up to the Acropolis as a religious celebration. Here is a plan of the Acropolis, and this changes over time. Notice there's a temple here that was removed, and there are several versions of the um, Parthenon. Uh, it was built, the Persian invasion burned the city, burned the Acropolis, and then the one that we know of today was built. But there are several layers of them on this site. So there's three buildings we should know from the Acropolis. The Parthenon, most important Greek temple, the Erechtheum, which is strange in how they built it, and the Propylaea, which is the gate. And we notice something that the art historians like to point out, that these columns are almost always evenly spaced. It's a little tricky how you space the end column, but the Propylaea is slightly wider for the entrance, signaling that's where you enter. <coughs> this is what it looks like today, typically cranes around because they're always working on it. Um, pardon my digressions. There's always something to learn here. We are learning to be much more careful about restorations. So for example, when they cleaned the Sistine Chapel ceiling by Michelangelo, there was years of debate about whether they should do it, how they should do it. They used pure cotton swabs and pure distilled water. No chemicals, you know, because you can screw those things up and ruin them. Well, these drums, you have a little dowel in there, and then you put the next drum on, and that holds everything solid. And this would actually be square, so they won't turn. Well, the Greeks used bronze. In the late 19th century, they went to restore it, and they used iron, stronger than bronze. Why was that a dumb idea? What does iron do? It rusts. <laughs> So the iron rust, and when it rusts, it expands, and it's cracking all the marble. So then, they, and they can't pull them apart because it's totally wedged in because of the expansion. So now they say, well, we should use titanium. And I say, you idiots. The Greeks used bronze dipped in lead. Why don't you do what they did? It lasted for a couple thousand years. So anyway, that's all, you know, how you do restoration, you always, there's a whole now field. We don't have it at Pratt, but at Columbia, in the architecture school, they have a whole restoration department that studies in detail how to do it right. And it's always being improved and discussed. Now we have to know a couple of the building types for ancient Greece, the Agora or Agora. The Agora is a public space. Every Greek city has one. It's a center of athletic, artistic, and political life. So you're making political speeches. 
Um, you want to go shopping, it's the mall. It's where the market is. And uh, let me just digress. And they didn't, weren't necessarily able to keep to it, but the Greek notion of the ideal size of a city-state was the size that you could put in a theater and they could all hear a speaker. So that that's the community. That's how you communicate. That's the politics. You know, we don't go on Twitter or listen to CNN um, or Fox, depending on your politics, but rather this ideal size of a city-state is that which can communicate. And then you find out that at the height, <clears throat> don't quote me on this, but I think there's about 40,000 people in Athens. There's that many people in the apartment complex across the street from me. And they churned out Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, um, you know, uh, Sophocles, uh, the great mathematicians, the great playwrights, the great all from a community the size of an American university. So a very interesting phenomenon. Another key Greek building type is the theater. And here we have the theater at Epidaurus a bit later. And they originally had dirt seats, and then later in Hellenistic and Roman periods, they get redone with stone. The Greek theater looks out over the landscape. We're going to distinguish it from a Roman theater in a moment. And it's very much symbolic of the ability of the Greeks in a Greek city to be able to gather all citizens in one spot. And we're going to see later the importance of Greek drama. We architects get off on the geometry of these things. The Roman theater, similar in layout, but totally different in conception, not built into the landscape, but in the center of the city, so it builds up. And there's a structure here so that we do not see beyond the backstage. Okay, Greek sculpture. You might have heard the phrase, he looks like a Greek god. So that comes from here. So we'll get to that in a minute. So the first thing we want to observe about Greek sculpture, and we'll talk about this at the end of today, is Greece was not an isolated phenomena, but part of this Mediterranean culture. And what was uh, the great early Mediterranean culture? 2,000 years before classical Greece. Egypt. So here's the Egyptian sculpture from uh, around 2500 uh, BC, and here we are around, let's round it off, 500 BC, so 2,000 years later. So what do we have in this Roman sculpt, I'm sorry, this Egyptian sculpture? Remember, the Egyptians were highly stylized. They had rules, and they stayed in effect for thousands, years, literally thousands of years. This is the figure. Rigid, arms at the side, and one leg forward. So that's the Egyptian uh, stylistic device. Now, if I look real hard, I could find one. There's a whole other story here about this being a couple. This is the Pharaoh. Notice his wife is putting him forward. In other words, he gets his authenticity through her because earlier on it was a goddess worshiping culture. But that's a digression. Here is an archaic Greek sculpture, early Greek sculpture. So we use the term archaic. There are three major periods in Greek sculpture. It's called a kouros, which means a young man, and kura is a young woman. And um, notice, frontal, arms at the side, fists, one leg forward, so we see the influence of the Egyptians. Now this is stylized. It doesn't really look like a real human being. It has, pardon me, a stupid smile. 
It's called the archaic smile that all sculpture has. And it has a kind of braided hair. So this is a stylistic device that's shared. But then we see beginnings of this realism here and how the flesh works around the knee. Egyptians had that as well. The Koros, statue of a youth, and there are also female versions. This is a key example from the Archaic period, 600 to 840 BCE, and we see these features that had been picked up from the, Egypt, from the Egyptians. Frontal position, stiff arms at the side, fists, one leg in front of the other, and we see in the Greek sculptures also this stylized braided hair and what's called the archaic smile. In the archaic period, we have simple, direct, powerful presentation of the key idea. We'll contrast that in a moment to the classical period. In the classical period, we have the sculpture that we think of if we think of Greek sculpture, you might have be familiar with the phrase, he looks like a Greek god. So this is what they looked like. And of course, nobody looks that good. So we have idealism here. We'll talk about that later. Our most prominent sculptor is Polycletus. And we have Polycletus's canon, which is a series of proportions, etc., that make up the ideal figure. We also associate this with contrapposto. That's a putting the weight on one leg, which gives a curve to the body. It's sort of a gentle S-curve that we see in this sculpture. Now, I have another sculpture, a small one, uh, down at the bottom. And I want to make the point that much of this Greek sculpture was made in bronze. So they did carve marble, and they also cast bronze Almost all the bronze examples are gone because over the thousands of years they've been melted down for other uses like making cannonballs for war. But some of them were being shipped on, I remember the Greeks are an Aegean culture. They're shipping all over to all these islands, etc. And sometimes a ship sinks. And when we find those ships, we sometimes, they might have been shipping some sculpture, and those are the bronze that we have to this day. Hellenistic period, three great periods. You can, you can divide them up even more than that, but I'm simplifying it. Archaic, classical, Hellenistic. Hellenistic is, pardon me, um, we start throwing in soap operas. So it gets dramatic, emotional inner emotion and outward expression. So this is dying Gaul. Gaul is um, one of the uh, other cultures that Greece was at war with, the Romans were at war with them, and they were very much admired by the Greeks and the Romans, and so this wounded dying Gaul soldier is heroic and noble in his death. And then this is the Laocan group. So Laocan was a priest who could foresee the future and warn the Trojans that the Greeks were going to invade and for the Trojan War. Because Athena was on the side of the Greeks, she punishes him by sending a great serpent to kill him and his sons. And so here they are being strangled by this serpent. So a very dramatic, emotional rendition in Hellenistic Greek sculpture. Archaic, simple and direct, primitive, strong, bold statement of the underlying original idea. Classical, full manifestation in of the idea. Hellenistic, overdoing it to the point of emotionality. Now, notice, I just used a value term, overdoing it. Different periods of recent history would value one of these more than the other. So in modern times, we tend to say this is overdone. I go to my students and I say, which one do you like the best? And most of them like this one the best. Well, we're talking about taste. Michelangelo was there when they dug this up. He uh, did a replacement for the missing arm. 
he considered it the greatest sculpture of all time. So if you like this one the best, you're in good company. So taste changes over time. Now, one more note on sculpture. We associate Greece with idealism. We associate Rome with realism. So, one way to distinguish it. This is the way I think I look. This is the way I actually look. <laughs> so, ideal is nobody looks that good. <laughs> That's how, one way to describe ideal. And then look at how incredibly realistic this is. These were very skillful artists throughout uh, much of history. I mean, the Egyptians were incredibly skillful 2,000 years before this stuff. So Greek ideal, Roman realistic. Greeks, the pure white temple, the pure white sculpture, Purity, idealism, guess what? We, wanna, we, we like our picture of the Greeks as this pure white ideal, but they were painted. We don't know exactly how they were painted because in 2,000 years the paint is worn off, but there are sufficient chips uh, left there that we're, we know it was the case. And not only that... Now something we have to note about Greek sculpture, unfortunately, it was polychrome. We like to think of this Greek art as white and pure, but it was painted all over. We don't have the paint anymore because in thousands of years it's worn off, but there are flakes that provide evidence for that. And the same is true of the Greek temples. And so here we see a Beaux-Arts student's speculative restoration of the Parthenon and its color. We know it, these were painted in various colors, but we don't know exactly what they were. Okay, wrapping up, let's look at Greek culture and see how we want to position the Greeks relative to ourselves. Now, I should apologize for the brevity of the material we saw. We saw basically two Greek temples there are dozens of them, but they all evolve around the same ideas. So I simplified it to the Parthenon. So Greek sculpture, first of all, idealism. This goes beyond the art, as in nobody looks that good. The architecture, the proportional system that gives us the curly volute of the ionic column. But then Plato's philosophy, here's a chair. What makes this a chair? Well, it's got four legs. Well, what if it had three legs? Well, it's got a seat in the back. Does it have to have a back? Plato says it's a chair to the extent that it participates in a universal ideal chair in a, another realm. So there's the realm of ideal forms. This world is made up of partakings of that in an imperfect, corrupt way. Imperfect in that there's no perfect chair, corrupt in that it's eventually going to fall apart and break down. But the fact that a chair can crumble doesn't change the fact that there is an ideal notion of a chair. Where did we hear about that before? Did we hear about Plato earlier in this course? Plato's cave. Plato describes prisoners chained in a cave and a fire is throwing light on the wall and things moving around in front of the fire create shadows. And all the prisoners see are the shadows. They don't see, they can't turn around and see the real world. That's us. All we see are these imperfect things, but there are, there is an ideal realm with the perfect examples. Now, why might Plato think that? Why, what would be an example that presents that idea? Because you could say, that's baloney. There's only chairs. There's no ideal realm. 
How many people had geometry in high school? Okay, so you s refer to, among other things, a triangle, right? What's a triangle? Triangle is something with three sides, three points, etc., etc., on a flat plane. Did anyone ever see a triangle? Can you draw a triangle? No, you can draw an imperfect approximation because a triangle is made up of lines, lines have no width, it's made up of points, points have no dimension. You can't draw a point, you can't draw a line, you can't draw a triangle. But we can do all kinds of things with them. We can do the Pythagorean theorem, we can, you know, we spent a whole semester in geometry course working with triangles and squares and lines even though they don't exist in this realm. So they must exist in some mathematical realm. To this day, mathematicians debate about whether that's the case. But it provides a demonstration of this idealistic notion. So mathematics is an example of this idealism. And the Greeks were highly developed in their mathematics. <clears throat> the greatest Greek mathematician and regarded as one of the three or four greatest mathematicians of all time is Archimedes. Now, Archimedes of Syracuse, Pythagoras of Samos, Euclid of Alexandria. They weren't all in Athens. These Greek figures were all over the Greek world. So I want to make that point. So Archimedes wrote a book that we read to this day, and he said, <clears throat> How many grains would it take to fill a sphere the size of the universe? And this book does the math. So first of all, how big is the universe? So they knew, you know, they knew how big the earth was. They knew the distance from the earth to the sun. They uh, knew that beyond the planets are the fixed stars. He calculated the distance to the fixed stars, assuming that to be the size of the universe. He then calculated the size of a grain of sand, how many, what would the volume of that be, how many, does the whole thing. And it's mostly an exercise to deal with big numbers. <laughs> You're like 10 to the 8th. Uh, then we said, okay, the Greeks had geometry, but they didn't have calculus. Oops. Uh, turns out that Archimedes wrote a book on calculus. We didn't have it because, you know, 99% of all the classical texts have been destroyed. We just have fragments here and there. But one of the things they did, papyrus, paper, was so valuable that they would take a book and bleach it and then write over it. And so an ancient prayer book that a monk used in the Middle Ages turns out to have been a bleached copy of Archimedes' book on calculus. <laughs> And we now have it. You can buy, bought it. Uh, not that, I mean, my calculus was so long ago in college. And, you know, but it was just great to read. Wow, you know, um, it, you know, this. And then we have the Pythagorean theorem, which then becomes part of uh, Euclid's work. So when we study geometry today, plane geometry, which means two dimensions, and <clears throat> We have you know, the theorems, the axioms, the proofs. That was all uh, codified by Euclid in the 4th to mid 3rd century BC. So Greek mathematics was highly developed and we're making discoveries from it to this day. Philosophy. There is um, a statement that I don't agree with, but you know, you can argue that all of Western philosophy is nothing more than footnotes to Plato. So all the issues are there in Plato, and we've been writing footnotes ever since, and that's Western philosophy. I don't fully agree, but you can make that argument. So we have major <clears throat> periods and figures in Greek philosophy. The pre-Socratics, interesting stuff. What's Heraclitus' famous quote? We only have fragments of the pre-Socratics. <clears throat> and only fragments of Heraclitus. But what's one of those fragments? You cannot step in the same river twice. Put your foot in the stream, take it out, put it in again, 
where you put your foot before is moved along. So if I put this down, then I put it down again, the earth is, you know, rotating and <laughs> put it in the same spot. All is change. Socrates. Socrates didn't write, but we have his thought in Plato's early dialogues. We believe that the later uh, Republic by Plato is just using Socrates as a mouthpiece, but earlier that's probably pretty accurate, Socrates' ideas. Plato was an idealist. There's a world of ideal form, and then our world partakes in that. Aristotle, who's more um, this worldly, realistic, and it was as much a natural science. We have Plato's writing. We don't have Aristotle's. Aristotle's writing that we have are student cliff notes, but he wrote about the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's all lost, but he was a naturalist, biologist, uh, on and on and on. And this is a famous painting from the Renaissance School of Athens. In the center are Plato and Aristotle. Plato pointing up to the realm of ideal forms, Aristotle pointing to this world here and now. And then we get things like Neoplatonism. Alexander's soldiers bring back ideas from India. They get into Greek philosophy as Neoplatonism, and it becomes central to Christianity. So there are all these continuities, and we are still involved in uh, Greek philosophy to this day. Science. They knew the Earth went around the sun. They knew the size of the Earth's orbit. They knew the uh, size of the Earth. <clears throat> that was done uh, by Aristophanes, who was a uh, Alexandrian, 240 BC. And he says, OK, the sun directly overhead, and then he goes a distance away. The sun directly overhead, what's the distance in between? Multiply that by the hours of the movement of the sun, and he gets 25,000 miles for the circumference of the Earth, the same we have today. And then I'm going to use a word we shouldn't use. The Greek computer. <laughs> so in one of these shipwrecks, they discover this thing. <clears throat> and it was discovered in 1903. But it's, it's called the Antikythera mechanism. And it's basically an astrolabe, if you know what a, an Arabic astrolabe is. But it's a device for calculating. It's a calendar, calculates the phases of the moon, the moon's eclipses, you use it for navigation. So it's only in the 1700s that Europeans are able to make something of equal sophistication in terms of the cutting of the bronze gears in this thing. But it's basically a, a pocket calculating device for calendar, uh, astronomical phenomena, etc. And a lot more Greek science. Theater. Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the three great tragedians. We read the Greek tragedies to this day. To this day, uh, I'm a fan of the Lattimore and Green translations. There's just a hardness about them, a kind of gem-like quality to the polishing of the words. And in these, in a way, you might consider the Greek tragedies footnotes to the Iliad and the Odyssey. You know, what happens after? And how does this expand into the Greek mentality? Religion, haven't mentioned that at all. The Greek myths are foundational to our mythology, psychology to this day. Freud uses the term the Oedipus complex. Um, the Greek pantheon, all the gods and goddesses. There's 12 in the official pantheon. Actual Greek practice, which was kind of personal. Uh, the oracles, you'd go to the oracle at Delphi before going into battle for predictions. The Eleusinian mysteries, uh, ceremony, you know, ceremony. So there's a whole bodies of literature about this. Democracy. Now, what the Greeks meant by democracy is different than what we mean. It's evolving concept. 
but we owe a lot to the Greeks, and Athens was not always a democracy, it was off and on. So here's Pericles giving a speech. But the founding fathers writing the American Constitution studied dozens of Greek constitutions of all these city-states and numerous constitutions to try to figure out how to make something that would work. Okay, wrapping up, let's think about who these people are. So I'm going to read this, and the slides are online. If you want any of this, you can just grab it from the slides and paste it into Word. 2,000 years before Greece, the Egyptians were there 2,000 years before Greece, building a great, elaborate, sophisticated civilization. But it did not have the concept of the individual. The Greeks had that concept. They introduced that notion. Now, what do we mean by individual? It's an ongoing discussion. The Greek temple stood apart from nature, representing the emergence of human society, and the freestanding columns represent the emergence of individual human beings. The Greek poet Pindar writes, one is the race of gods and of men. From one mother we both draw our breath. The gods were not so different. They were like us in many ways. They were not all-knowing, not all-powerful, and were subject to the same foibles as human beings. They would have affairs and jealousy and battles with each other, and in a way, they are manifestations of human psychological principles. And they were destined to be overthrown by human beings. So in Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound, we don't have his Prometheus Unbound, it's lost. But Gide wrote one. <clears throat> the Titan Prometheus is empowered to choose the successors to the gods and chooses humankind. He steals from the gods not only fire, but the arts and sciences. And Zeus says, you idiot! <laughs> They're going to overthrow us with this stuff. And Zeus punishes Prometheus, who we can see is a stand-in for human beings, by chaining him to a rock. Every day an eagle comes and eats out his liver. Every night it regrows. And just to jump ahead in uh, Gide's Prometheus Unbound, one day Hercules is hiking through the mountains, and he's attacked by an eagle, and he kills it. And he's dragging the eagle with him, and he comes to Prometheus, and he says, Oh my God, was that your eagle? And Prometheus says, that's okay. <laughs> and then uh, Hercules smashes the chains and releases uh, Prometheus. So Prometheus is defiant, yet resigned to his fate. So he rails against Zeus for punishing him, but at the same time accepts his fate. So Greek humanism is sometimes called the tragic tradition. The individual stands in defiance, knowing that death is inevitable, and accepts this fate. What's our attitude toward death today? We'll just make a pill. <laughs> Let's find out where in the D where, where there's something wrong in the DNA that causes us to age and die. Let's find it and fix it. So that's the Western hubric idea in contrast to the Greeks' acceptance of their fate. What would the Greeks think of our hyper-technology today? Those living in the Greek story of Prometheus would be delighted. It was for all of this, all of our science, technology, going to the moon, that Prometheus brought us fire in the arts and sciences. Our minds, our imaginations, our ambitions exist for these tasks. However, they would caution the Greeks would caution modern Westerners that we should not delude ourselves into believing that any of this will change our fates. So, the influence of the Greeks. Architecture, literature, art, philosophy, government, math and science. All of these disciplines today have threads of Greek influence in them. The architecture I showed you earlier 1935, the U.S. Supreme Court based on a Greek Corinthian temple. Inside, no similarity, but the entrance here. Our literature, 
Homer's The Odyssey. How many people read The Odyssey in school? Cool. And did you read Fagel's translation? That's now the most popular. There are many translation, but Fagel's is the favorite today. James Joyce use, loosely bases Ulysses, Ulysses is the Latin name of Odysseus, on the pattern of the Odyssey. And Francis Ford Coppola's movie, Apocalypse Now, The Journey Up the River, is modeled on Odysseus's Odyssey. Until 200 years ago, education meant Greek, Greek and, and Latin. In other words, reading the classics in Greek and Latin was what you did at Harvard or Yale or Oxford. That was an education. And for those of us who <laughs> don't read Greek or our Latin is rusty, all of this is translated. This is the Loeb Classical Library, and these are the volumes in the Greek literature. And it gives the original Greek and the English translation on facing pages. And it's kind of dated. It reads kind of woodenly, and they're redoing all the translations to feel more contemporary for us today. Now, one last idea, claiming Greece. For some cultures, Greek was regarded as so important that subsequent cultures claimed to be the legitimate descendants of or continuations of Greek culture. So the Romans uh, very much adopted Greek culture. They had the same pantheon, all the Greek gods. So the Greek god Zeus is Jupiter for the Romans. Aphrodite is Venus for the Romans, etc. But it's the same deities. 18th and 19th century Britain and Germany vied for who was the true legitimate inheritors of the Greek tradition. The American Revolution studied the Greek constitutions. The Romantic poets, Shelley, Byron, and Keats, they were admirers of Greece. They went to Greece to support the Greek uh, rebellion for independence against the Ottomans, etc. And they were admirers of Greece. This is a woman, Ruth Hamilton, wrote a book, The Greek Way. She and her friends dressed in togas and tried to live like Greeks. But there's also rejections of Greece. So deep ecology, the notion that human beings should not dominate nature, but should be respectful of uh, nature as having equal moral right to exist as we do, uh, rejects the kind of Greek humanism. Antiphalocentric feminism criticizes the hypermasculinity of Greek culture. Decolonialism seeks to see history not as descended from Greece, but more globally. And finally, <clears throat> there's a set of three volumes called Black Athena, which looks at the broader Mediterranean sources for Greek culture, including African and Egyptian, and seeing the Greeks not as originating these ideas, but appropriating them. So here's a question for section. Was Greece exceptional? Gives you something to think about. Thank you.